Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Rod Hemp. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television, a television program designed to take you through the Bible in one year. We're excited about that. We're in the history of Israel. This is interesting. So, Corey, what are you studying today? Today we are studying Hebron, a city where David actually ruled over Judah for several years. Hebron, really? That's fascinating, Corey. Now, uh, what did you do today? Well, today I brought something that I love to do, and that's a, a letter. I've brought a letter to read from Saskatchewan. Show and tell. <laughs> Very interesting letters from Saskatchewan. We'll look forward to that. Ryan, what's up? Today I'm studying the Davidic Covenant. There's something very unique about it. Excellent. And today we learn that the Lord established David. In a few minutes, we're going to be teaching about this. And, and as we understand this, we realize that the Lord is very involved with Israel at this time. We'll talk about that and more as we continue. Today, you and I are going to focus in on the ancient city of Hebron. Now, Hebron, as you will come to see, has a very um, long history in ancient Israel down uh, from the patriarchs all the way into the time period of the kings of Israel. David even um, reigned here for several years before he became the full king over all the tribes of Israel. So it was a very important city to him. The name Hebron means association or league, and its first biblical mention is in connection with Abraham, who camps just north of this city in its surrounding highlands at the oak trees of Mamre, defensively advantageous hills that were once covered in famous oaks. Abraham also purchased a burial cave in the vicinity of Hebron. Here, we see him conducting business in Hebron's city gate, as well as learning that the city's original name was Kiriath Arba possibly meaning the city of the four giants. Numbers 13 tells us that right after the exodus from Egypt, three descendants of Anak were living here, large, intimidating warriors that the spies of Israel tied to the Nephilim of Genesis. During the conquest of the Promised Land led by Joshua 40 years later, the city of Hebron is listed as conquered and is given to Caleb as an inheritance. Hebron also becomes a Levitical city of refuge and the capital of Judah and royal residence of King David for seven years. Parts of this ancient city have been archaeologically excavated. The finds were once thought to discredit the biblical account, but today are understood as supporting it. Excavations revealed a large 20-foot thick defensive rock wall dating from before the time of Abraham, and the city's gate tower still stands 20 feet tall. Following excavations in the 1980s, Hebron was declared to have been unoccupied during the time period of the conquest. This would pose a major problem since the scriptures openly claim Israel took over a very occupied fortified Hebron. With more excavations and reviews, this myth has finally been put to rest with overwhelming evidence from this period. Not only was Hebron settled, it was fortified during the days of Joshua and even shows a destruction layer. The archeological record for the time period of King David's residence at Hebron is unfortunately silent. Excavation on the summit of Hebron, where David's palace likely was, has not been allowed. 
Now, as we are studying through First Chronicles, you'll notice that it is mostly about uh, the reign of King David, except for the first few chapters. Those are uh, the chronologies leading up to David. But the meat of First Chronicles is all about this reign of David. Now, why that is, is because David was a foundational king for Judah. Uh, the, the covenant that God made with David was that David would be a dynasty founder, that his sons would always be on the throne. Uh, as long as Judah, the kingdom of Judah survived, there would be uh, a son of David on the throne and that one day the Messiah would come and God would give the Messiah an everlasting kingdom, but that Messiah would be a descendant of King David. So very important theologically here. And remember that the books of First and Second Chronicles are essentially a rewriting, uh, a later writing of the histories of the books of First and Second Kings. They are written from a priestly perspective, more of a theological perspective with a heavy emphasis on uh, the Davidic covenant, this covenant that God made with David and on the line of David uh, because um, the priests and uh, the people of Israel at the time when Chronicles was being written uh, were looking for that Messiah figure to, to come and rescue them and redeem them. So that is one of the main themes behind Chronicles. As David secured himself in the kingdom of Israel, God established his rule. David did things that put him firmly in control. Nothing could challenge him except the problems with his family. Nevertheless, David learned to focus on God and see his heart. With this in mind, we learn how David defeated whatever troubles came against Israel. His conquests were both remarkable and stunning. He had no trouble with the people who had trouble with Saul for years. David subdued kingdoms around Israel and then stopped. You see, unlike kings, other kings, David didn't try to dominate the world, but God gave the nation of Israel land with very specific borders and the knowledge to live in security inside of those borders. First Chronicles 18 verses 1 through 8. After this, it came to pass that David attacked the Philistines, subdued them, and took Gath and its towns from the hand of the Philistines. Then he defeated Moab, and the Moabites became David's servants and brought tribute. And David defeated Hadadezer, king of Zobah, as far as Hamath, as he went to establish his power by the river Euphrates. David took from him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, and 20,000 foot soldiers. Also, David hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 of the Syrians. Then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus, and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute. So the Lord preserved David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadadezer and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Tibhath and from Kun, cities of Hadadezer, David brought a large amount of bronze with which Solomon made the bronze sea, the pillars, and the articles of bronze. 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. As we read through the Bible, we learn a lot about Israel's history and we understand what God is doing. 
God has revealed this particular portion of history to us so we can see his work in the kings. We can see his work in all of the priests and all of the people of ancient Israel. We have witnessed many things. The family of Israel going into Egypt, coming out a nation, and then Moses bringing that nation to the place where God revealed his law to them. And then now we have the time of the judges. We go through that. And then we come to the time of the kings. And Saul is interesting, not a good king, but David now becomes the king. And this is fascinating as we continue to read through the history. Now, it's important for you to get your Bible guide out. If you don't have it, write to us at one of the addresses or go to www.biblediscoverytv.com, biblediscoverytv.com. When you go there, send a donation, and we will be happy to share the Bible guide with you. Now, let's consider this as we talk about works of faith. When we named this, the only way to really say this is the Lord, the Lord established David. The Lord established David. A lot of people seem to think, well, David was lucky and he did this and did No, it was the Lord who established King David. King David was anointed king of Israel by Samuel. We've already read that. And he was, this was done years before. So God has already prepared David and through time and through all kinds of situations, David now comes to the place where he is king. We read 1 Chronicles chapter 17 to 20 to keep up going through the Bible. And we're going to look at 1 Chronicles chapter 18 verses 1 through 8. Now listen carefully to the passage as we look at this. 1 Chronicles 18, 1 and 2. Begin like this. After this, it came to pass. David attacked the Philistines. He subdued them and took Gath, its towns, from the land of the Philistines. He defeated Moab, and the Moabites became David's servants and brought a tribute. Can you believe that? You know, this is amazing. The Philistines and Moab were subject to David. God makes us to rule over his enemies. Now, remember, we fight for God. We do not fight for ourselves. And our definition of ruling over God's enemies is like, I'm going to stand up there and rule over you. No, no, no. God has a different definition. And it is our job. And God has said to us, in the time that he came back after he died, three days later, he came back and he said to us, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go into all the world and preach the good news. All the world. Preach the good news. Now, let me say something. There is not one refugee. There is not one person in the planet who is subject or who is more powerful than anyone else. They might have the possession of Satan or the possession of God's, but when somebody comes to Jesus Christ and says to him, Jesus Christ, be my Lord. The God of the universe is the Lord of your life. Well, let me tell you something. There is nobody who is going to out bid that in terms of power. God has made us powerful, beloved. God makes us strong, regardless of who does what. And so that's very important that we understand. We go back to chapter 18, verses 3 to 6. Listen carefully. And David defeated Hadazer. He was the king of Zorba. As far as Hamath, he went in to establish his power by the river Euphrates. And David took him from one, took for him 1,000 chariots, 7,000 horsemen, 20,000 foot soldiers. It's a lot of people. David also hamstrung all the chariot horses, except that he spared enough of them for 100 chariots. When the Syrians of Damascus came to help Hadazer, king of Zorba, David killed, listen to this, 22,000 of the Syrians. And then David put garrisons in Syria of Damascus and the Syrians became David's servants and brought tribute 
So David preserved, uh, the Lord preserved David wherever he went. Now this is important to understand that the Lord, it is God who gave David great success. God gave David great success and preserved him. Beloved, we are preserved and we are successful when we follow God. When we follow God. A great businessman said to me once, he made millions of dollars and uh, I had met him and we were with the several people and, and he was talking. He said, you know, I need to tell you that. And he had, he had lost a lot of money and gained a lot of money. He said, I need to tell you, I've lost several million dollars several times. And the reason that I am able to do this, and this is what he said, because Jesus Christ is my Lord. And if God tells me to give it all over here, I'll give it all over there. See, God had established that businessman. And that's the way God works with us today. We try to hold on to everything. That's not the way God works. Now we go to this. Verse 7 says, And David took the shields of gold that were on the servants of Hadassar and brought them to Jerusalem. Also from Tabath and from Chun, the cities of Hadassar. David brought a large amount of bronze with which Solomon made the bronze sea the pillars and the articles of bronze. Isn't that fascinating? So here we have the Lord's temple and it was decorated with victory. And God makes his victory known to the people who hate him, who do not like him. There are many people who hate God. Well, let me tell you, it's not wise because God is supremely going to take over the world very shortly. And there's going to be no question who he is. And it's not a good thing to hate God. So I would say to us today, beloved, on this side of the cross, outside of the Old Testament, that we should love the Lord Jesus Christ. Next time on Quick Study Television, we're gonna be talking about this establishing David, the Lord continuing to do that. As David gets in his mind what he's going to build for the Lord, it's going to be a very interesting study next time on Quick Study. Right now, here's Ryan. Ryan, what's up? Well, we're not in the prophets yet, but today I'm gonna to be exploring a very important prophecy. However, this particular prophecy isn't actually found in the prophets, but is one of the most important. Today we study the parallel passages of 2 Samuel 7 and 1 Chronicles 17. And though they are very similar, there are some key differences between them. While one prophesies of an immediate heir for King David, the other prophesies a more distant heir. Let's explore. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 11 to 16, God's prophet Nathan prophesies of a son who will proceed from the loins of David himself, a son who will be David's immediate successor, and that if that son commits iniquity, God would discipline him. However, he would not lose his dynasty as King Saul did. In verse 16, God promises three things to David, an eternal house or dynasty, an eternal kingdom, and an eternal throne. This prophecy, of course, was fulfilled through David's son Solomon. 
King Solomon does in fact commit iniquity by falling into idolatry and is disciplined by the Lord. However, God's covenant love remains with him. Interestingly, there is a parallel passage in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verses 10 to 14, that is similar, but also has significant differences. In this passage, Nathan proclaims to King David, Furthermore, I tell you that the Lord will build you a house, and it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be of your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my mercy away from him, as I took it away from him who was before you. And I will establish him in my house, and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever." Notice the key differences between these two passages. In 2 Samuel, the son is immediate, yet in 1 Chronicles he is distant. And in 2 Samuel, the son is a sinner, yet in 1 Chronicles there is no mention of sin. Also note that the three promises of 2 Samuel are repeated here, but a fourth is also added, an eternal son. And I will establish him in my house forever, verse 14 says. This passage is clearly a messianic prophecy, a prophecy of Jesus Christ himself, given some 1,000 years before his birth. Until this prophecy was announced, it was only known that the Messiah would be born of a woman, would be a descendant of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, and would come from the tribe of Judah. This prophecy now revealed which family within the tribe of Judah the Messiah would come from, the family of David. The Messiah was to be a son of King David. It's really important to understand that prophecies of Jesus Christ are found all throughout the Old Testament, not just in the books of the prophets. In fact, Jesus himself in Luke 24 says that things are written of him in the laws of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Jesus certainly fulfilled all the prophecies concerning his first coming. So why should we not expect the prophecies of his return to be fulfilled as well? You know, that's a really good question. We should expect that. And the, the question that everybody asks is the prophets. You know, I read in Jeremiah, there are prophets who are prophesying things happening. And then there are other prophets who are prophesying, prophesying the opposite things happening. God says, I'm going to get those who are prophesying the wrong things happening, and I'm going to tell the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, this is the interesting thing. God prophesies himself through a prophet, but other prophets prophesy their dream. And that's the real question, mm -hmm. is how do you tell the difference? And that's something that you have to know God. You do. You have to understand that, you know, if he says it and it comes true, he's a real prophet. But Absolutely. if he says it and it doesn't happen, yeah, that's then, somebody that's, you know, they're in trouble. Yeah. What did, what did they do to prophets in the Old Testament when they didn't come when true? They, they were false prophets, they killed yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was a capital punishment because it was, it was a form of deception. It was a form of trickery of the worst kind because you're claiming to be speaking on behalf of God. So if you're caught lying in that to the ancient Israelite mind, there was no greater sin that was blaspheming, pretending to be speaking for God, and yet all the time you're speaking for yourself or you're speaking for a fallen angel, a demon, an, an evil spirit. Speaking um, for a fallen angel or a demon, that's a major thing. That's a yeah. false prophet. Yeah, and it, it's, it's scary when you look at, you know, like the gift of prophecy, realizing that there are, there is a spiritual world, um, it, yeah. You see it in the Old Testament, you see it in the New Testament. So it is, it's one of those things where to be a prophet is a very high uh, calling and it's not without its dangers. Mm -hmm. Well, of you course. you must stay close to God. It's a heavy responsibility. Very and you've got the word of God. Not to be taken lightly at all. And, and you today, you know, with the word, of, the word of God, the 66 books by 40 authors, thousands of years, all with the same theme. But the word of God is the, the true tale. So if you have somebody who's saying, Thus says the Lord, thus says the Lord. You, you say, okay, but you want to look at the word of God first. You want to make sure that he, what he's saying is true. Yeah, we, sh we, the fact that prophecy exists, the fact that dreams from God exist should not uh, distract us in any way, shape, or form from reading our Bible and knowing the word of God because that's what keeps us grounded. God has given us that first. And I mean, how many 
instances in the Bible do we learn this through others' experiences? Mm -hmm. I mean, David, they had the book of the law. If he had just read the <laughs> laws for the kings and followed it, the whole end of his life would be completely different. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, Completely different. It really would be. So it that's one be. of the a huge themes throughout the scripture is take it seriously. Yeah. Don't get distracted yeah. from it. Mm -hmm. and Everything else is great. That it's we additional. Are, <laughs> we are on this side of the cross, and yeah. we're in a time when, yes, the gift of prophecy is... is uh, manifest, but at the same time, the word of God is spoken, and we exists. need yeah. to follow. We can't the ignore it. It's right there. It God. exists. You know, so we shouldn't ignore it. It exists. <laughs> Nor should we become lazy. Yes. And and yeah. not not very take it as a very personal thing. That's right. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you do today? Well, one of my favorite things, as you know, and as you know, I love to get your letters, and we got one uh, in the month of March from Saskatchewan. We got a letter from Clay and Mary, and it was just so lovely. Saskatchewan that, is a separate province in Canada. That's right. So for, just so people know. For people who don't yeah. live in Canada and would know that. All right, so, and, and, and Clay and Mary, they haven't heard this letter either. So uh, it says, Dear Quick Study family, how refreshing it is for us to see a Bible study on TV that feels like we are together in the same room in person, Great. which is one of the reasons yeah. why we decided to <laughs> yeah. sit at our round square table. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it says, we used to watch your program when Corey was younger and it was only her and her dad, Rod. Now I'm thinking maybe that was the episodes of the yes. weekend editions. All yes. right. Uh, it says, uh, but then could not find it on TV anymore. Lately now we have found quick study on our vision channel, but we only get it Monday to Friday at 6 a.m. and we absolutely get excited about it. We are very early risers, so we study with you early every morning. Thank you for your energy and excitement and your investigating of proof of God's word. Thank you for your love of Jesus and dedication to tell others. We pray for you all and encourage you to continue just as you are with love and prayer, Clay and Mary. Thank you. Oh, thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank, you. much. thank you. Very sweet. Such encouraging we, uh, words. We get we get letters all the time, and I see them, and you see them, and, and it's just amazing. It's so encouraging. And we get emails, is, we get it? letters, yeah. we get messages on uh, the different forms of uh, media that are on the new media, and it's excellent. And I just want to tell you that we very much appreciate it, and uh, we don't spend a lot of time. Go ahead. And if we could fit everyone around our we table, would, yeah. we would do that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll make the table bigger. That's how we'll have to do that. But. Uh, anyway, we do appreciate it, and uh, we wanted to say thank you to everybody. And uh, there was uh, there's so many emails that I got, and so many, and it, it, we can't answer them all, but we answer what we can, and what we do is we say thank you. So thank you so much. And I want to remember something, that Jesus Christ is God, and Jesus Christ is real. And Jesus Christ came into our hearts. And when we invite him, when we pray, the Bible says that when you pray and ask Jesus to come into your heart as Lord, he will do so. He will forgive your sin. He will give you eternal life.